Well, good morning. Some of y'all are like dancing to that thing. You got, got it down. You know, you've heard it before. That's great. Glad you guys are here. Welcome to Seacoast Church. Um, I'm honored to be with you. My name is Josh Surratt. I know many of you may be new to the church if I haven't met you yet. Uh, just so grateful that you have chosen to join us this weekend. I wanna also welcome all of our campuses. We're glad you guys are with us this weekend. Maybe you're watching online. We're glad you're here as well. I had the chance to worship at Somerville last weekend, and man, it is amazing what is happening up there. Pastor Roy, the team, Josh, you guys are doing a great job uh, up in Somerville. They were busting at the seams. I mean, we, uh, as soon as we get into this new building, we're gonna figure out something in Somerville, because. They have outgrown their space, and um, it was just amazing. I did have one person uh, say something to me in Somerville that happens a lot when I go to campuses, and so I just wanted to kind of address it. They said, hey, Josh, you look a lot taller on the screen than you do in person. <laughs> so I wanna thank you guys for bringing that up. Um, it is something that we do, the cameras, we pay a little extra to kind of thin us out and stretch us out a little bit, and um, I, it makes me look about 6'4 on the screens, and in, in truth, I'm only 6'2", and so. You're right, <clears throat> and they're laughing here because that's not true either. But, uh, but we're glad all of you are here, and I wanted to share something cool too. Last weekend, uh, my dad, Pastor Greg, talked about uh, writing hesitation out of our story and kind of learning not to hesitate in certain things, and we had uh, an opportunity that surfaced last weekend. Uh, actually, uh, one of our, our senator who was here was sharing some of the impact of this, uh, the, um, the, I don't know if you knew, and if you watch the news, the government's kind of having some issues working together right now, and so there's a shutdown uh, that's happened, and the Coast Guard was affected. In our area, the Coast Guard is affected in a big way. There's, I've heard between six and 800 people who are not getting paychecks for the work that they're doing right now during the shutdown, and so the chaplain of the Coast Guard reached out to us last week and said, hey, we'd like to do something to serve these families. Would the church be willing to help us? And some men's group leaders jumped in and got involved. Our Somerville campus jumped in and got involved and said, hey, we'll open up our campus. And so Friday morning, we served over 350 meals out of our Somerville campus to the Coast Guard and their families. So I thought that was really um, encouraging and, and just great uh, because we can't fix all the problems in Washington, but we can serve people who are impacted by them. And y'all just did a great job in the partnerships that we worked with to do that. And, um, but, but as we jumped into the message this weekend, I wanna ask you a question as we get started. Have you ever realized that you were in the middle of a fight that you didn't even know was happening? That ever happened to you? Uh, another way of asking that would be, how many of you are married? <laughs> I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but sometimes I'll be coming home from work and I'll have a good day and I don't always come home and and you know, put on my great dad hat. But when I've had a good day, a good, good attitude, I get home and I'll jump on the floor, start playing with the kids and you know, connect with, with the kids. And then I'll realize that there was a fight that was going on before I got home between their mother and one of the kids. I didn't know what was happening and I had inadvertently taken the wrong side of that fight just by coming in and playing with the kids. I don't know if that's ever happened to you or maybe at work. Uh, somebody comes to you and asks you for your opinion about a project and, and you're thinking, they just love my creativity, and uh, you know, I, they, they, they value my input, but what was really happening is they were having an argument uh, with another employee about what was a better idea. They were looking for people to join their side of that argument, and so you joined a fight you didn't even know that you were in. Some of you may have had that happen to you before as well, but the problem is if you don't know there's a fight happening, then you're probably gonna end up on the losing side, kind of like Alabama. I don't know if they had heard there was a game a couple weeks ago. If you don't know, <laughs> that there's a fight, that then you might end up on the losing side of that fight, right? Well, we're in a series called Unwritten, and I'm loving this series because we're, we're talking about the story that God wants to write in, in your life and my life and our church's life this year. And we talked about you know, giving God the pen and, and, and saying, God, I want you to author this story. And many of you have come in uh, new this year. We've seen record attendance this year, and a lot of new people came at Christmas and have been coming in the new year. And, and you're, you wanna maybe start the year off right and you wanna give your life to God. And, and I just wanted to share with you uh, that, that when you give your life to Christ or when you decide, God, I'm gonna, I want you to author my story, you actually enter into a fight that whether you knew it or not, it's been going on for a long, long time. And, and so we're gonna talk about that this weekend. And, and what we're gonna talk about, I'm, the story, uh, the uh, part three is writing victory into your story. How many of you would be okay with it if 2019, if a, a word that described the year for you was victory? Would you be okay with that this year? All right, 
Most of you guys are good, the rest of you guys are okay with losing, that's, that's okay. <laughs> but if we're gonna experience victory this year, the, the implication of that statement is that there's some kind of a battle, right? There's some kind of fight that's gonna happen and, and we're gonna face battles this year that, that we need to be ready for. Uh, we, we need to be battle ready and especially this year at Seacoast Church is a very interesting year to jump in. And, and I'm so glad you guys have, but, but this year we're getting ready to move into a new building and we've already sensed a lot of kind of spiritual resistance to that. And, and so we are in a fight and, and we've got to recognize the fights going on so that we have a chance to win. And, and some of you have even felt resistance as you came to church this, this weekend. And I, I wanna tell you the enemy is not your spouse or your kids or the person who stole your parking spot when you were trying to get into it in the parking lot. Like that, that, those aren't your enemies. Maybe they're adversaries but they're not your enemies. We do have an enemy, and uh, the Bible talks about it in Ephesians 6, 10. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So he lays out who the, who the fight is against. You may wanna to turn to your neighbor and tell them, you are not my enemy, right? You, your enemy's not sitting here. Your enemy's not flesh and blood. We do have a fight, but it's, it's with spiritual forces. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. That's my prayer for you this year. That's my prayer for me this year, that we would stand our ground. I don't know what kind of battles you're gonna face. I don't know what kind of resistance that you're gonna come up against this year, but my prayer is that we would go into this year with our eyes wide open to the battles that, 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 that's going on, the battle that's happening, and that we would stand our ground at the end of the day, that we would be a church that, that stands our ground. Last summer, I had a chance to preach for a friend of mine uh, who pastors a church in Dublin, Ireland, and I'd never been over there before, and so went over and, and he's got multi-campus, he's got one outside of Dublin, one in Dublin, and great church, and I got there a day early and he kinda gave me a, a tour of the, 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 the country and it was beautiful, and he dropped me off at my hotel room and, and he you know, was gonna pick me up for church the next morning, and I asked him, I wanted to go on a run, and I didn't know the land very well, so I said, hey, Jamie, is there, um, are there any predatory animals that I need to be afraid of, because I'm thinking about going for a run and I just don't wanna get mauled by a, tiger or anything like that. And he was like, no, you, you know, you're good. There's none of that here. And so I was like, okay, great. So I went for my run. I get back to the hotel. It's got a little door to a balcony. And so I open up the door and it's a beautiful day. And I'm sitting on a chair reading and preparing for the next morning and just kind of resting a little bit. And all of a sudden, a bumblebee the size of my head flew into the room. Have you guys ever seen these things? I mean, just a massive bumblebee. You, I'm talking about like you hear them long before you see him, you know what I'm talking about? Like a big time deal. And so flies into the room and I won't go into all the details of my childhood, but my most recurring nightmare as a kid was being stung by bees, swarmed by bees. I just, I got stung a few times as a kid and so I had this like mental thing and so I jump up and I'm like, all right, where is it? I hear it and I find it and I'm trying to protect myself from it and, and, and then I realize he's not trying to kill me and so I kinda, okay, that's cool, what's he doing? He's trying to get back out. He had inadvertently flown in and he was trying to get back out and so he flew out where the doorway was but he was a little too high and there was a window above the door. And so he would just like slam his head into the window and make all this sound and he'd go after it for about 10 or 15 minutes and he would like stop and rest and then he'd gear back up and zzz, trying to get out and so I'm like, I, I am gonna help this guy get out the window. So I grab like a blanket and some pillows and I'm trying to like shoo him out and he can't get out and I go out on the balcony. I'm like, come on, Bumblebee, this way. Like, come, you get out through the door, you, you can do this. And, 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 and I kid you not, from the time he flew in until the time I checked out of that hotel the next morning, he never got it out. He continued to slam his head up against the, against the window. And it's like he could see all the freedom, he could see where he needed to go. He could see the creation that God had made for him, the flowers and the pollen, and, but, but he, couldn't, he couldn't break through to get there. And I wonder if some of us can relate to that. There's some issues that we've faced in our life that, that we, 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 we know we wanna be free. We, we know where we wanna go. But would you agree knowing where you wanna go doesn't mean that you know how to get there? 
And like this bee, you need a little bit of help. And it's like if I could have just become a bee for just a few minutes and spoken in bumblebee language and said, hey, dude, there's a way that you can break through here. There's a way that you can get the freedom. It would have made life a whole lot easier. And, and with God's help, I'm hoping that this weekend we can fill our minds with some truth, be aware of the battle that's ahead of us, and, and learn that, man, with God's help, we can experience breakthrough. We can, we can see freedom. We can be victorious in some of these battles. And so, so we're gonna look at how do we develop a, a game plan spiritually for this battle that we're facing. And by the way, some of you are like, dude, it's week three of January. This is a little early to be going like spiritual warfare. Um, normally we do that in the summertime, like when it's just the believers that are here. Um, but, <laughs> but I wanna, like, I, I, I'll just say it this way. I feel called of God to give this message this weekend. I feel like we need to be ready for this year that there's some stuff God wants to do and we just need to be ready to fight. And so as we jump in, battle plan for, for spiritual warfare, the first thought for us, if we're gonna be victorious, is we have to understand our enemy. You gotta understand your enemy. You know, we have an enemy and, and we need to learn his tactics and learn some of his weaknesses if we're gonna be victorious. You know, there was a football game a couple weeks ago in college, I don't know if you guys watched that or not, a pretty big one, a national championship, and Alabama played against Clemson, and both teams had about nine days to prepare for the game, from the time their last game happened to the time they played each other, and so what did they do during that nine days? They, of course, worked on their own game plan, but, but they watched film, that's what you do. The coaches watch film, the players watch film, and they're, they're watching their opponent so that they can get a better understanding of what they like to do, of what their strengths are, what maybe some possible weaknesses are that you can exploit uh, and, 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 and figure out. And if you study the tactics of the enemy, it's gonna give you a leg up in the fight. And, and you may remember the third play that Alabama had when they had the ball, their offensive possession, they lined up into a formation and one of Clemson's defensive backs saw something that he had seen on film and he had a feeling he knew what they were trying to do in that play, and so he jumped the play, he got the interception and took it back for a touchdown, and it was a turning point in that game. And the point is it's because he was prepared for, for what they were gonna do. He had studied the enemy. So I wanna study the enemy with you for a little bit. In fact, I love the way this verse says it. It says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. We're just gonna expose the enemy for a couple minutes today. The first thing that we, we need to learn as we think about the enemy is one, the devil is real. The devil is real. Did you know that in America, according to a survey that was done a couple of years ago, only 56% of adults believe that Satan actually exists? 56%, my, my feeling is it's probably lower now because that number's been trending down for several years. Only 56% of, of people in America believe that there is a devil. You know, a, a lot higher percentage is that people believe in God, uh, believe in the afterlife, but there's a decreasing percentage of people that even believe the devil exists. And frankly, I think it's a brilliant strategy of the enemy. Because if he can get you to think he's not there, then you have no chance to win the fight. And so we'll just kind of sleepwalk our way through or coast our way through not knowing that we have an enemy. Now, on the other side, there are some people who they will find Satan in everything. And it's like, no, it's not like, Sometimes it's just that we're dumb and we do stupid things, you know? And, and we try to blame the enemy, like, ah, I ran out of gas today, and the enemy's really after me, it's spiritual warfare. Like, no, you just should put gas in your car a little earlier than you normally do, okay? It's, so, so let's not be in that camp. Let's not like look for a demon in every situation or circumstance, but let's also not be blinded to the fact that the devil is real that we have an enemy. The Bible talks about it in Revelation, kind of describes this battle that happened in heaven. There is a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. I love this next sentence. But he was not strong enough. So he's real, but he was not strong enough for God. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled, and say this with me, to the earth. He was hurled to the earth. He went from heaven to the earth and his angels, which we know as demons, with him. This is, this is a reality that we can't always see with our eyes, but it is very much at play in our world today. We have an enemy. His name is Satan. He was an angel. His name was Lucifer. And, and he was 
cast down from heaven. I love that and, and, uh, Jesus described it one way. He said he came down like a flash of lightning. So he, there was a battle, but there was no chance he was gonna win it. it was a, he was totally outmatched, and he was cast down to the earth, and he continues to try to, to create havoc to this day. The devil's real. Another thought for us, the devil is against us. The devil is against us. Satan is not your homeboy. Satan's not a guy that you're gonna have drinks with, you know, one day in the afterlife. Satan is actively looking for ways to mess up your life. He is on the prowl. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He, he has no intentions of anything but evil for you, for your life. He'd like to find ways to get into your marriage. He'd like to find ways to get into your home. He'd like to find ways to get into your head. And he, he is actively looking to mess you up. Look what it says, be self-controlled and alert. This is First Peter. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. The devil is real. He is not for you, he is against you. He also has power. The devil has power. You're like, really, pastor? Like, you talking about the devil has power? He does, it may not be in the same way that you think he does, but he does have power and he exercises it probably daily in most of our lives. The most common way that he does it is he gets us to believe something that's not true. The most power that he has over our lives is right between our ears. It's when we start believing things that aren't true. He started in the Garden of Eden. You remember that story when he approached Eve and he said, hey, did God really say that you can't eat that fruit? I wonder if God just doesn't want you to, to be as powerful as he is. I, th I think he's holding back from you. Have you considered that God re really is, is, is trying to hold some things back from you? And she starts to believe a lie and she ends up acting as if it's true. And he does that to us all the time. I don't know what you struggle with, what lies that you're tempted to believe. Sometimes it's related to the motives of other people. You know, somebody says something to you and we start to be like, you know what, that person is such a jerk. That person, you know, intended that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start looking into their motives and, and we start living as if that's true and then all of a sudden the relationship is broken or maybe it's related to your own story. Does God really have plans for your life? Does God really have a future for you that's good, that's, that's prosperous? I wonder if your best days are behind you, man. You know the real you. You know the guy that you look into the mirror every day. You really think God wants to use you? And we start to, to entertain that thought, we start to believe it, then we start to act as if it's true. And he attacks us in all kinds of different ways. Maybe it's in your marriage. Really? You need to be faithful to one person for the rest of your life? Surely God wants you to have more fun than that. There, where, where's the joy in that? And you start to believe these things. When in reality, it's the, the greatest um, expression of love that we'll experience here on this earth if we'll do it God's way, but we start to believe that maybe he's withholding something from us, or maybe there's better or whatever, and we start to entertain that, then all of a sudden we find ourselves thinking thoughts and then acting on thoughts that we never thought that we would do because the enemy has power. Most of it is right here between our ears. A great example of that is as it relates to anger. Uh, Ephesians 4 says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. It says when we get angry, that's not a sin. You should get angry from time to time. But he says when you get angry, if you, if you sin in your anger, you don't deal with it, you don't process it in a healthy way, you don't, you know, have, have maybe even a, a healthy confrontation to, to understand more around what the motives were and, and work towards reconciliation, then we, we bottle it up and the enemy, it says, gets a foothold in our life. We start to believe maybe things about their intentions that weren't true and, and, and anger turns into rage, turns into bitterness, turns into broken relationships because we give the enemy a foothold by the lies that we believe. So the, the devil's real. The devil is against us. The, the devil has power, but there's good news. The devil is subject to our God. The devil is subject to our God. What do I mean by that? I mean, his power is nothing compared to the power that is at work within us. One of my favorite passages in the Bible, by the way, we got lots of scripture today because we need to be battle ready. 
we need to be armed. And so just take these, maybe even take the outline sheet and just meditate on some of these scriptures. It says, you dear children are from God, that's the truth, you've overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. See, Jesus came, I, mean, I talked about that bumblebee, like if I could just become the bee, Jesus became one of us, the word became flesh. He spoke our language, he showed us, he walked this earth, he lived a life with no sin, knowing that we couldn't do that on our own. He died on a cross and he overcame death. And there are a lot of skeptics out there uh, about a lot of things, but one of the things that, that skeptics have the hardest time figuring out is what do I do with the resurrection? It's a historical fact. There were eyewitness accounts everywhere, written documentation of that. Jesus overcame death. He was victorious over our final enemy here on this earth. And because of that, he empowers us by his spirit, fills us with the spirit that we would be able to live that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so you can be aware of the enemy's tactics, you can be aware of his weakness, but you do not need to be afraid of the enemy. He has no power over our lives as believers if we will not let him, if we'll stop letting him mess with us and get into our head. And so, so he's subject to our God. So we gotta understand the enemy but we also have to understand the weapons that we have to fight with. That's the second thought, the second point on your outline sheet is, actually, I've done this like three times. I should probably look at my notes a little bit more. I do wanna share this with you before I jump to that next point. Um, why does all of this stuff matter? I think that there are some battles that are going on in our city, in our country, in our families, and, and, and they're spiritual battles. I don't think everything's spiritual, but I think that there are some battles going on that are spiritual. And, and one of them, an example, would be the Dream Center. Uh, about 12 years ago, we got a, a newspaper article in the USA Today came out and said that North Charleston is the seventh most dangerous city per capita in the United States. And I thank God that there were some leaders who got around the table and said, this is a spiritual issue. This is not only the government's problem, we have a place in this fight. And so we, we established a dream center in North Charleston and we began to partner with some great organizations, with the government, with law enforcement to, to try to rectify that and to open up some mentoring programs and to feed some people and do a medical clinic, all the things that happen out of the dream center. And, and what looked like a normal article in the newspaper, you know, this isn't a spiritual thing. What we found is over the last 10 to 12 years, We've seen incredible change in the city of North Charleston. I don't even know what number it is now. It's outside of the top 200 most dangerous cities in America because it was a spiritual issue and when the people of God engage in the fight, we can see us take some ground back. Remember that the enemy has been cast on the earth. He feels like he has dominion in this place but actually we can take ground back that the enemy has stolen. And so a week and a half ago, that's the picture here, is uh, we opened up a dream center in West Ashley because we think there's some spiritual battles going on there that God's called us to be a part of. And so yay God for that, yay God for West Ashley, and um, let's, let's engage the fight. Let's understand our, our enemy, let's understand the weapons that we have. And the first one, uh, passage I wanna show you, uh, I love this verse, 2 Corinthians 10, says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Now we're gonna be tempted to fight with the same weapons that the world does. Uh, we're gonna fall back into those those old ways of doing things, but he's saying, hey, there's a different way, and those weapons don't actually work very well. That's why many of us find ourselves stuck in the same things over and over and over again. He says, on the contrary, the weapons we fight with have divine power to demolish strongholds. Strongholds, you may wanna circle that word, strongholds. What does that mean? That's that thing that maybe every new year, you think, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find victory in this area. It's that thing that we butt our head up against the window. We're like, man, I, I, know, I know there's freedom out there, but I don't know how to get it. And, and the Bible calls them strongholds, but it says that we have some weapons that will help us demolish those strongholds in our lives. What are they? First one is the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is a weapon that is at our disposal. Would you agree with me that names are a pretty, pretty big deal, pretty important? I know for me growing up, the Surratt name was something that my dad used a lot. And this was before we had a church of any size or significance in terms of number of people that were reaching. Nobody knew who the Surratts were, but when we would do things that, that were contrary to our values, my dad would, would say, hey, no, 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 we're Surratts. And Surratts stick together. 
what you guys have been doing, the fighting, that's not sticking together. You always stand up for your siblings. Or, or, or hey, dad, everybody else is going to the party, man. I, I, you know, I, what? No, we're Surratt's. And you know what, Surratt's do things a little bit differently. And Surratt's are guided by different morals. And, and what he was doing is he was instilling a sense of identity inside of the kids that, man, our name matters, that we're Surratt's, and, and that's, a, that's an important thing. And any one of us can do that in our homes, because names are a big deal. If, if you don't believe that, think about the opposite, the negative side of names. Let's say you're sick, feels a little bit like a cold or a respiratory infection. It's no big deal, you take some antibiotics, you're working on getting rid of it, and then you go to the doctor and they, they run some tests and, and they give that sickness a name, and the name is cancer. Would you agree that that changes the game a little bit? Our family's experienced that recently. That's, that's a powerful name, that's a scary name. There are lots of scary names that we deal with. Names like depression, fear, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, divorce. There's lots of names that are at play in this room and at our campuses right now. And, 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 and names can be scary, but I wanna encourage you, there is a name that is above every other name. There's a name that every other name has to bow to, and the name is Jesus. And we can use the name of Jesus. We can access the power that comes with the name of Jesus. A couple of scriptures for you. Uh, Therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. There's no exceptions here. Every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name of Jesus, above every other name. It's what allows us to to have relationship with God. It says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The name of Jesus, it's a weapon at our disposal. Have you ever wondered, why do we as Christians, if you've been around the church for a while, why do we finish all of our prayers with, in Jesus' name I pray, amen? If you're like me, that was like a habit that, you know, just kind of it's always been there. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Have you ever wondered like why we do that? Think about it this way. If you were friends with, let's say, um, a guy named Jeff Bezos, you guys heard of him? Uh, He's the the wealthiest man in the world right now uh, until his divorce goes final, and then I'm sure that will change, but he's wealthy, a very wealthy man, uh, founder of Amazon, and let's say Jeff was your friend, and, and, and as you were getting to know Jeff, he said, hey, I want you to, I want you to do some, some really good things in my name, and so I'm gonna give you a credit card, and it's got the name Jeff Bezos on the, on the, the bottom of it, and it's linked to my bank account, and, and I'm asking you, do, do some good for the world in my name. What you would do is you would grab that credit card, and you would, you would go, and you would, you would be able to go, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to fund that orphanage in the name of Jeff Bezos, so if you'll run this card, it's gonna connect you to a bank account that's gonna transfer some resources that's gonna fund that bank account. Or I'm gonna open up this dream center in the name of Jesus. I'm gonna feed these orphans. I'm gonna do this project in the city. And you'd be swiping that card and there would be unlimited resources for you to do what he told you to do in his name. Now if you take my credit card and try to fund the orphanage, you're gonna get a, a very quick notice that says there's not sufficient funds in that account in order to buy that orphanage. And I wonder how many of us are walking around and we're trying to, we're trying to make payments that, that, that only God can make. We're trying to experience freedom that only God can bring and we're trying to do it in our own name, our own willpower. Man, if I just try harder, if I just do this more and it's like God's like, man, I've given you an account. I've given you my name and I've said, man, you're gonna do more than even I did in my name. That if you'll line up to my will, it's not just like a blank check to let me just pray that I'm gonna win the lottery tomorrow. Good luck with that. Uh, it's, it's prayers according to his will. It's when we align our heart with God's heart. We can swipe that card. Jesus said, I want you to pray, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To my knowledge, there's not any addiction in heaven. And so we ought to be able to go, all right, and I'm not saying it's simple or oh, I, I realize there is accountability and, and there's people that need to walk this with us, but man, we should not doubt whether we can have victory over any area of, of bondage in our life or sin because we have the name of Jesus and the authority that comes with that. And so I just wanna encourage you, some of you who are tempted to maybe even doubt or give up or is, is there a future for me, man? In the name of Jesus, there is. According to his promise, according to his purpose, there is. 
We've got access to the name of Jesus. Another weapon that we have in our, oh, let me share this with you guys. We're just gonna do something this week. I don't know that we've ever done this in the history of our church, but we're finishing up the 21 day fast. There's a website here that you can get information, but Wednesday night, we're just believing God that his name is above every other name, and we're gonna have a service in here we're bringing some friends in that, uh, that God has used in some powerful ways, in the area of healing, in the area of breakthrough, and we're just gonna go, you know what? We're gonna create space, we're gonna align ourselves with your will, and we're gonna ask you to do some miracles, to do the miraculous, and here's where it came from. Uh, we've told you, and I'm not gonna get into a lot of details, it's been a difficult few months for our family. Uh, started uh, in my, my family, my mother-in-law got diagnosed with a tumor in her her chest, size of a pomegranate, and uh, we ended up being thankfully benign, but they had to take that out, and then my sister was diagnosed with cancer at 36 years old. And um, you know, as I've been processing that, and Lisa and I were praying, and I really got this sense that, that this is a spiritual battle. And not that I'm saying that it's not physical too, and we're going to doctors, and we're being wise about that, no question about that, so don't misread that, but I really got this sense that we are facing a spiritual resistance right now, that we just need to pray, we need to align ourselves, we need to line up whatever resources we can to, to pray for healing and to believe for breakthrough here. And then my thought was, why just do that for my own family when I know that all of us have issues that we're facing? All of us have battles that are going on, and so rather than just doing that for my sister and for our crew. I'm like, if, if you got needs, if you need healing, if you need breakthrough, if, you, if, you, if you're facing a battle right now, come on Wednesday night and let's just believe together that God's gonna move mightily. And he's gonna begin a, a work of victory and of freedom in our lives. And so um, have, I've heard of people that are coming from Atlanta, I've heard of people that are coming from different parts of the country because they just have faith that God's gonna do something cool. Don't miss out on it. Come, be a part of that. The name of Jesus the word of God, I'm not gonna preach all of these, but I wanna give you some scripture. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. The Bible says, as he goes on uh, to talk about the armor of God, he says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Have you ever seen like images of like a Roman centurion? They have these big like metal or steel you know, belts and they cover like their entire core because the core is the place where we're most vulnerable. If, if we're weak in the core, we're gonna be weak everywhere else. The Bible says the belt of truth is, is gonna protect our core so that we won't believe lies because when we start believing those lies, it weakens our ability to walk out our faith. And so the word of God, I encourage you to memorize some scripture this year. I turned 39 in September, so I turned 40 uh, this coming September. I made a commitment I'm gonna memorize 52 verses this year, just one a week, that I'm gonna add to the arsenal, add to the belt, that when I'm tempted with a lie, when I'm tempted to believe something that's not true, I can go back to the truth of God's word and claim that over whatever lies that I'm, I'm tempted to believe. The third is the power of your story, weapon that we have to fight with, the power of your story. Revelation says, and they have defeated him, the enemy, by the blood of the lamb, what Jesus did on the cross, and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. What does that mean? God has done some things for you. God has come through for you in some ways. He's set you free some, for some, some things. Most of us, we are not the same person that we were last year or five years ago, and we've seen victory, and that's not just for you. That's, that's victory, that's our testimonies that are being used to encourage the faith of other people. To, to, to go, man, if God did this for me, he can do it for you. And it, it raises the faith in the room or in the household or in your friendships. And, and, and people start believing, well, I guess if, if God could do that for you, maybe he can do it for me. And we begin to pray for that. And it almost, it's like it releases God's power to do it again and do it again and do it again. The word of our testimony. Who do you need to share your story with? Who do you need to share your story with? For some of us, it may be ourselves again. We need to be reminded God, help me bring to mind the things that you've done for me, the way that you protected me in the past, the way that you provided for me in the past so that I can have the faith that you're gonna do it again. Maybe it's somebody that you know, that you love, the power of your story. So if we're gonna win this battle, 
We're gonna understand our enemy. We're gonna understand our weapons. Last thought, predetermine the outcome. Predetermine the outcome. You don't have to wonder if there's victory for you this year. It's a, that's not a question mark. There is overwhelming victory. Look at this verse. Despite all these things, what are these things? In that passage, it's, it's, uh, it's circumstances in life, and, and we're gonna face some things this year, some battles that we go through, and despite whatever you go through, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. Overwhelming victory. Predetermine the outcome. God, I'm not gonna give up this year. I'm not gonna stop believing that you have a plan for me. I'm not gonna give up on this marriage. I'm not gonna give up on my kids. I'm not gonna give up on life. And some of us have been tempted to do it. And I wanna encourage you, the only way that you lose this battle is by quitting. Don't quit. Don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. Some of you, you, you don't see a way forward. You don't see where the victory is gonna come from. And sometimes you have to scream and shout the victory as if your team just won the Super Bowl, even though it looks like you're down by 30 points. I love the Battle of Jericho when it says, man, they, they circled it seven times and they let out a shout and every bit of that enemy was still standing right in front of them. They hadn't seen any signs of victory, but, but the shout came first. And, and for some of us during worship today, we're just gonna sing and shout and remind ourselves of the truth that God has not left us, God is not done with us, that victory is ours. Predetermine it, it's done. Anytime you begin to wonder, flag it as a lie. Who told you that? Who told you that? It wasn't, the, it wasn't, it wasn't God, it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was a lie from the enemy. Flag it and let's don't believe the lies. Guys, I'm just praying that, that we would get a little bit of a growl under us spiritually this year, that we would be battle ready, that man, I know the enemy is on the earth and, and he's taken some things in this community, he's taken some things from our family and this would be a year that we fight back and we, we take back what the enemy meant for, meant for evil and we, we see God do an incredible work in us and through us. You guys up for that? We up for the battle? Yeah. Awesome. Let's pray. Let's pray as we close. God, we thank you that the victory is yours. We thank you that overwhelming victory is yours. God, I know in this place there are some battles that are being fought right now. God, and, and I, I in no way mean to belittle the size of the fight, the challenge ahead, the depth of the problems. But God, today we choose to lift our eyes to where our help comes from, to lift our eyes to you, Jesus, so that in the name of Jesus, we would experience healing. At the name of Jesus, we would experience breakthrough and victory. The name above all names, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God, you are the beginning and the end. You go before us. You watch our backs. You walk with us. You promise that you will never leave us and that you will never forsake us. So God, make us battle ready. Help us to, to Lord, uh, develop the tools that we need to walk out victory, not just on Sunday, but on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that we would walk victoriously through this life and that we would take back the ground that the enemy has tried to take from us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.